So today's activity on stock exchanges is to a large extent driven by the so-called high frequency trading. That is, it's basically computers trading with each other. And there's no human intervention on, on a transaction basis. So, and this high frequency means it actually occurs with very high speed. So it's about, uh, so we're talking about computer made decisions that happen to be in microseconds. And with this, there's a, in, instead of um, actual human traders or human investors deciding that they want to buy a share right now and probably press a button, this is ages uh, in terms of high frequency trading, right? So the, uh, what you have, basically the amount of time it would need to hit the button, well, you would have several hundred transactions in that time made by computers that are also located within the stock exchange, right? So this is the new world of high frequency trading, if you like. So there, there, there is no clear cut um, business model for high frequency traders right now. They engage in a couple of strategies. Uh, one of them is, uh, is so-called market making. That is, um, you basically act as a buyer and or as a potential buyer and a potential seller uh, of the same security, let's say of the same share. And, uh, and basically you do transaction on both sides and you earn money because of the spread of both sides, right? So that, that will be like very similar to what a typical market maker, a human one, would do as well. So this is one big um, strategy for, for HFT high frequency traders. The, the second one is probably is arbitrage, um, arbitrage um, between markets. Let's say you have one stock that is traded in one stock exchange and another stock that, or, and the same stock is traded also at another stock exchange. So if there are small, if there are price movements in one, you want to have this information first in order to, in, to learn about this information and then go very fast to the other stock exchange and then trade on the new information that you got from here in the old stock exchange with people that don't know about this information over this side yet, right? So, and here we have a, we have a couple of examples where, where they really try to build connection between different markets. Um, and there it's uh, like, it's not only cable, so we're talking very physical infrastructure here. So it's not only we're talking about cables, but we're also now talking about microwave systems because information can travel faster in microwaves than it can travel in, in the usual cables. And we're talking about um, the speed of light here, right? So information is almost as fast as the speed of light in microwaves, but it is only like 70% the speed of light in cables. And therefore microwave transmittance is more favorable for HFT trip. Yeah. An example for this, um, for, for how frequency traders operate, um, is um, probably an example where a kind of large order um, has been executed, um, like selling a share um, uh, in a Swedish stock. And this order started in London. And today is normal that you go to several stock exchanges at the same time. This is not, this is not yet high frequency trading. You just hit several stock exchanges at the same time. So, and then what happened is that high frequency traders learned about this, let's say from two or three occasions, okay, there's someone here who's selling a share in, th in three occasions at the same time. That is, this has to be a large order. This will have an impact on prices. And then the order also traveled to the Stockholm Stock Exchange from the original one. But the high frequency traders have been able to be more faster, faster and move quicker to the, to the Stockholm Exchange. And when the original order kind of came into the, the, the Stockholm Exchange, then the prices here had already changed, right? So they get worse prices here because they have been too slow. And what too slow here means is they were probably taking about 80 milliseconds, a thousand, 80 thousands of a second to reach Stockholm, whereas high frequency traders only took 50 milliseconds, right? So this is the, the clear advantage that they have. None of them is, is noticeable to the human eye. Here, this is a nice example how geography comes, comes into play. 
So the, um, we have, and, and we can look at this at, at different scales. One is, it's important to link, let's say, the Japanese markets and the European markets and the US markets. So we have deep sea cables um, that, that run from New York to London, say, right? And we have additional ones that kind of reduce latency even more. These are big investments. So this is, and, and you know, if you can save 20 milliseconds crossing the ocean, that will make, you can make the better transaction. So we have large, we've seen large investments in these cables. We have also seen large investments um, in, uh, in the physical connections between Frankfurt and London. And so the a funny example here is that there's one firm who wanted to build a microwave network from Frankfurt to London. And they were looking for the right spots to do this. And then they discovered, hey, there is already a microwave network connecting Frankfurt and London. And nobody did knew about this. So obviously there has been a firm who made a lot of profits by just being faster than anyone else out there. Um, so this is one. And you, and you can also go further down very important today is where the computers are located. So the final computers um, in the stock exchange are a so-called co-location, um, in, in co-location facilities. So they want to be located right next to the main engine of the stock exchange. And in former times, right next will mean you sit next to this and then the next computer and the next computer. And then the computers who have been in the same hall, in the same room, who are located quite outside, at the fringe, they kind of uh, complained that they have a longer reaction time within the room to reach the computer of the stock exchange. So this has been now um, taken care of by standardized cable length. So you have a longer cable here um, and with more slopes, so to speak, and then uh, so that they all have the same, exact the same amount of time or, or length uh, before they can connect uh, to, the, to the computer. This is kind of how geography um, and finance and technology interact these days. In high frequency trading, the main issue is that you want to have information before it gets to, before other people can trade on it. And you also want to trade on this information. So um, the major thing is about prices, right? So you learn about the price change in one location and you can you want to run to the next location in order to take, take care of this. But it's also um, information that should be public, right? For instance, when you have websites, right, that blink. So they are, uh, and like websites where they have important indicators, consumer sentiment indicators and so on. And, you re and, and the high frequency traders put a lot of effort in being the very first one who, see, who, who are able to see a website, like co-locating next to the server where they put on the website first. And then they get, instead of being like 100 kilometers away, right? And then they get this information, oops, the new indicator is, at, is now X. They get this first. And then they run to the stock exchange and trade on this milliseconds, half seconds before other people trade on this. So in a way what happens is our understanding of what public means is now is different, right? Public means everybody knows it. And implicitly we thought everybody knows it at the same time, right? Putting something on a website in pre-high frequency trading ages would mean everybody would have the same information at the same time. Now with high frequency trading coming in, putting something on the website means the ones who are co-located to the computer know it first. Right? This is not the original mean of public. So in a way there is uh, high frequency trading creates information inequality and puts more information inequality into the system. This is not necessarily something bad. I mean, to have like short-term information benefits that actually what drives technology and, and, and what drives our economy. Uh, but here it's not clear whether all people or regulators really have understood that there is information inequality out there. I think what we see here is, um, uh, in terms of implications for the larger society, is, an, is um, kind of a double-sided sort. So on the one side, markets do get more efficient. So it's very clear that price indicating or price mechanisms act far faster than they did before. Right? And it's also usually, it's, it's quite clear 
that at least in normal times, liquidity is also higher, that is, markets get more efficient. On the other hand, what we've seen is um, there are also, there's more risk in the system with this. And the risk has manifested itself in the, in the infamous flash crash, uh, where we had a big dive in a lot of um, stock prices and then a jump up again. So clearly, this was not efficient pricing, this was a big risk. Um, and it's a risk for shareholders, and, it's, and this could also threaten financial stability, um, and it did. So, and not only did we, we, don't, we not only see the very big changes here, but we also see very small crashes, like thousands of mini flash crashes, so to speak, in single shares, where, where there's also the, the price finding mechanisms is disturbed, right? That's not what it, what it should be. So you have a, the same price for a share a couple of times and then a spike and then it goes back and it's back at the, sa at the same level again, right? So this is something um, that should not happen in, in, in good regulated markets. So we have more efficiency in normal times usually, but we have also higher risk than before and it's not clear that we have taken um, all measures that we should uh, against these risks. I think the flash crash has been a largely US phenomenon and many European exchanges um, have already some, some breaks and speed bumps, if you like, and, uh, and, and special breaks um, included. That is, if prices move up or move down up to a certain extent, and they won't tell you which extent, then they will stop trading for a while in order to get everybody back on track and try to, and where everybody, where actually humans are able to interfere. Right? So I think this is very worthwhile in kind of dampening the risk. But, this is, but risk is something that is, um, is also un the unforeseen character of risk um, that is not clear. So I don't think we have a complete picture of all the risk. Right? We have seen this, um, uh, the, the, these bumps also in currency markets where everybody said this is basically not possible because it's so deep. But we have seen it in the British pound. So the, um, there are some more risk over there. So I'm... Uh, I think it's probably time to slow down trading a bit, right? So the, uh, and there are the first attempts out there um, to have exchanges where you don't trade continuously or close to continuously, but where they only allow you to trade every 200 milliseconds or so, right? Or let's say every 50 milliseconds. That will be enough for all people to have more, at least for all high frequency traders, to have the same access to the same data. So, and, uh, so this is really about market microstructure uh, that we're talking a lot about these days. I mean, if you want to go for a more radical solution, um, I, would per I personally think uh, it, we, that it should also be okay if you can only trade once a day, right? So that's the good old fashioned way um, saying, well, that would be enough. We have one fair price, everybody could submit orders, and there would be one price per day. This, for all the investment bankers, is absolute nonsense. It's outlandish. But for human decision-making, if, if you come back to what these prices actually are made for, it's, they, they should signal uh, scarcity or abundance. And ultimately, they should drive human action. Uh, so investment decisions made by firms, financing firms. None of this takes milliseconds. Most of this takes at least days. So the, um, and I probably, I, I think that we might have a much slimmer, leaner financial system if you could all agree on having only one um, price per security per day. Again, um, this is kind of outlandish for all the participants, for the capital market participants. I think this would take a lot of risk out of the system. And we will have, um, uh, we will have, we, we could think more what we actually want to have from capital markets. In order to illustrate this, how many trades or point in time you actually do need per day, um, it's probably worthwhile to look at a Nasdaq outage. Nasdaq is a famous uh, U.S. stock exchange, and they had a couple of years now ago, they had problems, computer problems, presumably driven actually by high frequency traders. Um, and they, had, they could not trade for more than three hours. So what you see is the NASDAQ index moving like this, and then there's no trade at all, and then it starts again, right, quite regularly. So 
And market participants said, well, this as if it didn't happen in the end of the day, right? So and the world did not stop to move. They were just, you know, they were very, very simple. It just didn't trade. And it worked perfectly fine, right? So, so that's something, yes, you actually don't need this. For sure, you will generate less profits with all the trading industry, um, but it does work without any stop. And by, by the way, right, so we are all talking about continuous trading and how important it is to have access to capital markets and to trade like continuously. But if you could go a step back and look at what does continuously actually mean? It means from nine to four in the US. So, well, okay, what do you do after four? I say, yeah, you can go to overseas market, but trading activity is usually very low, right? So in, in one specific stock. So, so that is, your, you have to wait until the next morning before you can actually trade in earnest again. So most of the day is actually not, it's no trading or very little trading. Then you have Saturdays and Sundays, no trading, right? And we, got, we also have public holidays where there's no trading. So all this is possible. Right? But in the, in the remaining hours, it must be 100% continuous. Come on. Yeah. Right? I don't think this really is um, uh, this is well thought, thought through. Um, so I would say like um, putting some brakes on the speeding of trade uh, wouldn't hurt too much and would gain some, uh, and would gain us some stability, some more stability in the financial system.